What's up everybody and welcome to this week's What's on Kickstarter. Today we're going to be taking a look at some of the great, good, and not so good decks recently released on Kickstarter. I gotta say Steve, this was actually another small week and I'm kind of surprised by this. I feel like we're starting to get to a period of the year where we should start seeing some bigger campaigns coming out again and it just hasn't hit yet. Yeah, I mean it's kind of good because I think it's maybe building up to something bigger. But yeah, it's been what, three, four weeks now? Yeah, this will be the third week at under 10 campaigns, which is kind of surprising. We'll see what next week brings. But for this week, I got to say, man, there were some interesting campaigns, some that I hadn't seen before, some that are actually pretty cool looking decks. So I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to diving in. Let's, man. let's, uh, let's jump right in here and check them out. First up for this week's great deck, we have the Cartas Felicidad por Manuela Rudd. This is from Manuela Rudd. This is an actual deck that she teased a little bit on the live that we did with her not too long ago. Really been looking forward to this deck, I have to say. Really deserves the great rating this week. She put together an amazing campaign here. Taking a look at it, we can see that the primary language on this is Spanish. No surprise there. Manuela is primarily a Spanish speaker, so that makes a lot of sense. And the one thing that actually always stands out on these campaigns where they're multilingual is I always think it's actually a little easier to do fully one language and then fully another language because it allows more of a flow while it's kind yeah. of a preferential thing and we do see that more often than not people do kind of each part in one language than another and kind of causes a little bit of a break up there it is interesting to see that this actually is in both languages which i think is key there yeah. the one thing that does stand out that i know you point out here steve was that the campaign itself is actually based out of hong kong which is interesting because Manuela is based out of Uruguay and the decks are going to be printed in the U.S. and fulfilled in the U.S. So I'm curious why the campaign was listed as a Hong Kong campaign, especially because that ends up leading to uh, conversion on the goal and the pledge amounts, which is really interesting. Yeah, I wonder if it was just uh, maybe a, a mistake or something. Very well could be. So we'll have to see if there's any explanation behind that. Getting into it, we immediately see a really cool story here. The kind of explanation behind the concept of the deck, which is happiness. And we get into this really cool, pretty minimal, but very visual back design here. We have a central element, which really kind of speaks to Manuela's background in cardistry. And then the two hearts there, which are kind of a symbol of that happiness there. Yeah, that middle element kind of reminds me of those peppermints. Yeah. Definitely make me happy. Dude, 100% uh, really kind of look like that with the, that pinwheel peppermint. I'm personally not a big fan of mints, but I know that's kind of like a 50-50 split. People love them or hate them. So right. very cool design to it. Printed by USPCC. So she got the printer right there. I know she also talks about, here we go, printing and shipping right here. So fulfillment by Gambler's Warehouse. Really knocks out those two points right out the bat there. And it actually gets into a little bit of the shipping aspect of it as well, which is one thing we don't always see here is the breakdown where anything over a brick is actually going to get free shipping, which I think is really cool. Yeah, that is cool. Next up, we roll into it here. It looks like there's a nice little game plan as well, a little bit of a timeline as to how the deck is going to play out in the production side of things, which is something that I always love to see. I know for a while I've really been waiting to see people utilize these timelines more. The one thing that makes it a little difficult, obviously, with the playing card and with the state of the world as well right now is timelines are tough to, to adhere to strictly so who knows this right now says september 20 to 24 shipment shipments made by gamblers we'll actually see whether or not that will be handled immediately the very tight printing deadline here in the close proximity to the end of the campaign makes me believe that the artwork has probably already been approved by USPCC, so it's wait, it's likely just waiting the contract, which definitely helps expedite the process there. Yeah, usually it takes, I mean, six to eight weeks even after contract signs, so we're probably thinking a month after those deadlines right there. Yeah, yeah, so it should be interesting to see. I mean, receipt of funds to turnaround time, hopefully printing can go that quick, but I would be surprised. One of the cool things too that they mentioned about this is it will be a crushed stock deck. So you're looking at a minimum print run of 2,500. So a pretty good size print run for anyone interested in this with it being primarily a cardistry deck. That's always key because I know people love to see a cardistry deck that is very soft feeling in hand. Yeah, for sure. I like how the court cards all have smiles. Yeah, and that's one of the kind of custom aspects of this deck, which I think is really cool, is just the added happiness to all of the courts and then in addition to that it shows uh manuela herself as the queen of hearts which is really cool yeah 
colors look great too. Yeah, they really do. Cleaned up nicely. I like the yellow contrast to the black there. It looks really good. A fun Joker. Just a really well put together campaign. Again, the one thing that stands out to me on this one, as always, is the idea that if you're going to do a multilingual campaign, it helps to do the complete campaign in one language, then the complete campaign in another language. Obviously, there's parts of the campaign where you can't do that, aka the risks and challenges because it is a separate part of the campaign when you're entering the information. But for the story and all of the freeform aspect of it, using one language followed by another does help build a little more cohesion across the board. The other thing I would say too is relatively short risks and challenges and I do think that with the world still being in a relatively uncertain state with COVID and everything, it's very helpful to make sure that you're printing information in there that talks about potential delays on shipping side yeah it'd be good to see some more images as well you know i know she does have some prototypes uh in hand so it'd be cool to see some actual images of the deck in movement and different things like that absolutely yeah, might break up some of that text what are we looking at price wise we are looking at let's see about $21 shipped. So coming in right at what we would consider the normal price range there, that 18 to 21 mark. Very nicely done. Yeah. Really excited for this one. Yeah, good luck. Good luck. And while we're at it, if you're enjoying the show so far, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. And ring the bell, please. And next up for this week's good campaign, we have the Dark Patina, a truly unique deck of playing cards. I gotta say, really interesting title to a really catchy kind of line here. The one thing that does stand out to me, and this may just be a spacing on my computer here, but that hanger right there, the uh, the orphan, as Luke Wadey would like to call it, always irks me now that they've been pointed out, but I think ultimately really cool to see a nicely put together title and subtitle there. Um, for a single deck print, you're looking at a reasonable to high-end goal there. 12,000 is probably right on the cusp of where I'd say it's probably pushing a little high, but all things considered, already crushed the goal, which is awesome to see. So congrats on that one. Taking a look at the campaign itself, we're jumping into an interesting little story here. Bob does a really good job kind of building out the story of not only the deck, but himself as well. Talking about the idea of his background and where the idea for this deck came from, which I think is really cool. Uh, some of the imagery here obviously is really, really tiny. So while we're not fully into it yet, looking at these cards, the, uh, the suits here, it's almost hard to see what the artwork is. I think there probably could have been a better presentation on this to make sure you could see the artwork as well as as cleanly as possible. Yeah, they're just way too small for me. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at this yeah. on a pretty good sized monitor and they are tiny. Yeah, yeah. So one of the cool things about it too is you're looking at here, you have a hot foil back design on this deck, which I think is absolutely cool. Really intricate back design there. But the one thing that actually stood out to me on this as well is this is the actual only image of the back design throughout the whole mm. campaign. And personally, with a deck like this where you have a really collector-oriented uh, kind of customer base, you're really going to want to make sure that you're showing off the... Uh, that you're really showing off the decks themselves as cleanly as possible and as as much as possible so that people know whether or not they like it. Granted, this isn't a bad image necessarily of the back design, but something straight on where you can really see all of the detail is gonna be very beneficial, especially because if you look at the bottom and the top here, it looks like there's a lot of intricate design work in there that on the bottom is completely hidden due to the shading on the render and on the top is not really that visible. Yeah, are those skulls? Yeah, it does look like there's skulls right here. Yeah, it's hard to tell. It looks like it could be a cool design, but it's hard to tell. Absolutely. Talks about the whole redesign of the classic courts here into a fully custom court. They do look like they are one-way faces, though, which is an interesting thing. From a collector's point of view, doesn't really make that much of a difference, but does remove some of the magic use case for this. Um... Really cool designs, though. I have to say, very intricate. I just, I would love to see so much more of the deck itself, including that yeah. back design, because I feel like there's so much intricacy to the back design that is just lost in the images here. Yeah. Does it say who's printing it? So it does say who's printing it. Talks about legends. Let's see if I can find it again right here. Card construction. Oh, right so the one thing, too, that stands out to me on this one, and you can tell as a first time creator in this, Bob maybe didn't do as much research into kind of terminology into building this out as he could have. And I think, you know, one of my pet peeves here with a lot of these campaigns is you have someone who's a beautiful illustrator, clearly very talented, but using text as section headers. Build out a nice yeah. section header to add a little bit of consistency to it, but also to draw the eye to those specific sections. 
um, from the printing point of view. Looks great. You use the Legends logo. I absolutely love that. The interesting thing about it, though, too, is farther down in the campaign, it actually talks about shipping. And it talks about using a fulfillment service, but doesn't actually mention the fulfillment service. One big thing on that that I would say is you want to mention who your fulfillment company is as well and really give as much visibility into the entirety of the campaign as possible. You know, taking those headers and making sure that the sections just make a little more sense, they're a little more visible, will really help drive even more interest in this campaign. The other one that stands out to me on this one is that even though there's an add-on section, and I think there is a stretch goal section as well, they're not very well kind of highlighted. So while it talks about stretch goals in here, I don't like, here you go, 14,900 stretch goal, hot foil and stamp embossing as well as black stock. This is almost getting lost in the text. So yeah. it's really important to remember that a lot of these key parts, which can be covered in a feature section and dedicated, uh, and dedicated stretch goal sections really help to get people to understand what the entirety of the campaign entails, whether it be interesting stretch goals, the back design, the card faces, all of these little details add up to tell a really important sales pitch for someone who's going to be interested or not interested in this deck to get swayed into backing it. Yeah, I mean, one of the big things we always stress is definitely have enough images to really show the deck so we know what we're getting into. You know, I, by the looks of these court cards, the illustration is really beautiful, but uh, I'd like to see more of the images, you know? Yeah, 100% agree. And I yeah. think the uh, use of the project budget Kickstarter makes this as a function here where you can use it. I always love to see this. Um, the other thing that I would say on this is the risks and challenges for a first time creator really needs to be as expansive as possible. So he talks about the budget and the manufacturing aspect, but I think there's other parts that really would be important to touch on for this as a first time creator, like potential delays, like what happens if the cards don't turn out the way you expecting or if they're taking longer to print or any of these things that can be touched on in risks and challenges as a first time creator, it's just gonna help build trust. Yeah, how much of these coming up? Already seen a decent Ooh. number there. Let's see what we're looking at. Jeez, oh, that's a pair, okay. That scared me for a hot second there. We're yeah. still looking at $26 a deck, which all things considered with a hot foil back design on it is actually a pretty reasonable yeah. price. So really yeah. impressed on the price point there. Nicely done, Bob. I'm excited to see this deck come to life and I'm really glad to see it's already funded, but I think the visibility to it would be so much better if these images really were easily visible and showed people all of the detail and impressive aspects of this deck. Yeah, I totally agree. Good luck. Good luck. And next up for this week's first needs help deck, we have the Rock Edition playing cards. So I have to say, this is actually a really interesting project in and of itself, and I was really excited to see this, but the campaign itself just definitely needs help. There's a lot of parts of it that are just falling flat. The idea behind this deck is Rob Dutchin is a Canadian music musical photographer who works with musicians to photograph concerts and things. Steve's very familiar with this industry, but he's creating a deck of cards for all of the photographs he's taken in the past. Very cool way to kind of create a collection or a, a portfolio of your work. I really like the idea behind this, but there's several things that stand out to me as a little bit interesting. One of the first things that stands out, which I think is great, is he touches on who's going to be printing, which is USPCC. Very cool. Talks about crushed finish premium matte tuck box. Okay. Doesn't really talk about the stock, which could be a little hit or miss there. Not that big of a deal necessarily. Very unique, kind of non-traditional, much larger index uh, number cards, it looks like, which I think is kind of cool. We don't always see like what I would consider jumbo indices on decks very often in the custom world. But the one thing that stands out to me the most here is there's no back design image. So for a custom deck that's really geared towards collectors, to not have a back design image is a fatal flaw of a campaign. And it, yeah, for sure. In addition to that, I think one of the other big, and here we go. Oh, there it is. Well, is that the back design right there? Ah, oh, see, and to me, that's just like, that's uh, an, yeah, that's the back design. That's it. To me, that's an ad card at best. Like, and, and again, like, yeah. you know, to each their own on the design aspect of it. But for me, that's a very busy back design that feels kind of lackluster in a sense, especially because there's such an interesting idea behind this. And with the ability to use ad cards, this very easily could have been an ad card on the inside with a very musically themed back design itself. Yeah, I guess that's uh, everybody who's in the deck. Yes. 
So the other thing that's interesting about this is there's discussion about the MyTap that NFC technology. For anyone who doesn't know, NFC is near field communication. It allows cell phones to pick up basically like a radio-esque frequency off of objects, usually stickers, that then allows it to go to websites or pull up apps or things like that. The interesting thing about this one though, and something that I'm not exactly sure how this is gonna work, it talks about the cards themselves being NFC technology enabled. So as far as I'm aware, United, Plan United States Playing Card Company does not offer cards with built-in NFC technology. So from that point of view, I'm curious if the tuck or the deck as a whole is going to have NFC technology built in, or if the cards themselves are going to be somehow having NFC technology. And that that little bit of confusion or lack of clarity there, I think to me, is something that makes me a little standoffish about this campaign. Yeah, I think it says the, un the uncut sheet is what's going to have that NFC. See. Maybe mistaken, but I think that's what it said. All right, there we go. Sheet, on yeah. each card that will allow you to... Okay, so it'll be stickers on the card, on the sheet then, I'm guessing. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, definitely different. Yeah, no, it's an interesting concept. I don't know how how well that's going to play, all things right. considered. But the other side of it, too, and I'm curious because the whole purpose of the NFC is that it's going to take you to one of the great hits by the band. So I'm curious how, like, where that's going to take you. Is it going to take you to, like, a Spotify page with their site? Is it going to take you to... Um, a YouTube channel, like what's it going to take you to for the artist? That would be a concern yeah. on my end is how is it actually making sure that it's bringing the traffic to the artist whose music is being played. But again, I, I'm actually excited to see NFC coming into cards no matter what the kind of play on it is because I know we've seen this with Magic and other places where it's starting to actually make a really big impact and have really cool uh, aspirations behind it. So to see it come to regular playing cards or collector's decks and in the use of triggering a playlist to play music is kind of a really neat idea. Yeah, no, it's definitely going to be interesting to see, you know, how it's used moving forward. Yep. The other part that really stands out to me with this campaign is the fact that we don't actually know who's going to be fulfilling this deck. So obviously it talks about who's going to be printing, but fulfillment is just as important of an aspect of this because a lot of times with fulfillment, certain people in certain countries don't have luck with certain fulfillment companies. A lot of times certain fulfillment companies will use bubble mailers instead of cardboard boxes and protective wrapping. So a lot of people can be swayed to back or not back a campaign based on what condition they believe their deck may come in. So it's very important even if you're self-fulfilling to make sure you're letting people know that. Yeah, it's interesting seeing 20,000 stretch goal inside printed on all gilded tucks. Yes, a lot of uh, terminology confusion, it sounds like, on this yeah. one. So, yeah. What do they come in at? Let's see what we got here. We are looking at $18 shipped. So not bad. Yeah. Yeah, no, very reasonable price for a first-time creator's deck, especially because it's utilizing his own photography. So a lot of the cost there is going to be shouldered by him which i think you know yeah. at 18 dollars a deck if this is your style definitely worthwhile yeah good luck good luck and for another good deck this week we have the alliances linen air kingdoms of urden playing cards by tim olinger obviously having created 35 campaigns in the past tim is a very experienced creator in the playing card space so no surprise this is a very good campaign the one thing that always gets me about tim's campaigns though is he never mentions who's printing which is always mpc until the end of the campaign there. And to me, it's in the risks and challenges, but I'm a firm believer that it's not a risks and challenges kind of thing to tell people who's printing the deck. It's a factual statement about the campaign itself. So Tim, as always, my feedback to you there would be to make sure to let people know who are, who's printing earlier in the campaign. It's not a risks and challenges section. It's really a factual statement about the deck. Utilizing a feature section may actually really help there because it allow you to bullet point out all of that information and talk about what's available. Yeah, good luck. And another good deck this week is the Fibbers 2 playing cards and a little bit more. This is actually a really interesting campaign, and to me, the deck is not personally my style, but I get a kick out of the whole vibe of it. One thing that stood out to me that was interesting, because it's based on the Fibonacci sequence, they actually include a 1 card in the deck, which is a little bit out of the ordinary. Usually the 8 acts as the 1, but they actually have both in place here, which is really interesting. Um, yeah. The campaign itself has a lot going on with it, and I think being able to kind of show what the deck is all about is very important. Because to me, I'm seeing so many images 
of a rabbit based deck and then all of a sudden the original deck which seems to be a shellfish sea based deck you know, yeah. really making sure to separate those out so people understand what they're actually backing is super important. I think it's good to go into the backstory of how you got into this creation, but making sure that people can clearly distinguish with what the current campaign campaign is versus the past campaign is, is very important there. The other aspect of it too is, other than Ivory Press being the printer for this campaign, who else is going to be fulfilling here? Well, good luck on this one. Yeah, good luck. And for a needs help campaign this week, we have the form playing cards. I have to say, we've actually seen a lot of minimalist decks in the past, and I think they are really interesting to see. One thing that stands out to me about this one, it talks about the M31 casino quality stock. So obviously they're going with make playing cards to print, which I think is awesome to see. But this campaign itself just doesn't have a lot to it. All of the images are very small. They're not easy to see. The court cards themselves, I actually don't see specifically listed anywhere. So I don't know what a lot of this deck looks like. And to me, that's actually a pretty big issue there. The other thing that stands out to this one, is just, I think, a lack of understanding on how this process may work. So if we take a look at this, we can see that there's actually mentioned twice here, some due diligence around estimated turnaround time. Turnaround time is estimated at 9 to 11 business days from print for printing, then postage is subject to your location. That's all well and good, but ultimately, unless the shipping and fulfillment is going to be from separate places, many times people do MPC printing and fulfillment, roughly two to seven days in the UK, which leads me to believe that there's going to be self-fulfillment on that. But if this is going to be printed by MPC and then shipped to the UK for full further fulfillment, you're probably looking at 9 to 11 days just for printing and then potentially another 9 to 11 days for shipping to the UK and then potentially yeah. additional time on that. So while it's very good to have these timelines built out, I would actually really recommend looking into these a little bit better and determining what the actual timelines will be start to finish because printing doesn't mean they instantly land in your hand. And if you're going to actually be printing with MPC, then shipping to the UK is going to take just as long as most likely anywhere else because very often they're fulfilling direct out of China. So yeah. it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out timeline wise, should it fulfill, but good luck and something to consider on there, more images and really make sure that timeline is as close to accurate as possible. Yeah, good luck. So Steve, I gotta say, man, this was another short week, but what were you feeling this week? Uh, I'm feeling like holding on to my money this week. Steve. You know, I like Manuela's happiness deck, but um, it's red, man. And you know how I feel about red. But other than that, you know, I'm... I'm laying low this week. I gotta say, I was actually really impressed with the Dark Patina deck. I think that and Manuela's deck would be the two that I would back this week. Uh, in spite of the red, I'm not as much of a hater on red as you are, so I'll, <laughs> so I'll take it from time to time. I know you got, I know you have a couple red decks, so I know you don't hate them that, that much. But with that in mind, I would say those are the two for me this week. I think the Dark Patina has some really cool artwork from what I could see. I would love to see a better visual of all of that artwork because it was just so tiny on the screen and scrolling into it more just made it blurry so it wasn't really feasible there but yeah, interesting it's, week it's not my style but you know it definitely i'd like to see the images bigger so i know what i'm getting into. absolutely man and as always we'd love to hear what everyone else is planning on backing this week so if you haven't already make sure to drop a comment down below and let us know what decks you're going to be backing what decks you have coming in this week and what else you may be backing on kickstarter that you just thought was awesome ready to uh time to get into what we think's awesome on kickstarter i know man this is my favorite part every week i'm gonna tell you it's always <laughs> interesting to see because you know what some weeks kickstarter feels like a barren wasteland of nothing good and other weeks yep. there's just some really cool stuff on it yeah no i agree and uh i feel well especially when we have these kind of low low weeks with the card campaigns we have you know try to pick out two of cool campaigns that we like and sometimes that's always hotter than the normal i know man you uh <laughs> It's always tough to find something there because you find one, you're like, oh, that's really cool. And then you scroll through like 10 pages to find something else. And that's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I think it, a lot of it goes to Kickstarter searchability, you know, it's an interesting yeah. aspect and, up there. And the fact that, and the fact that I'm limited to what I can, what I can uh, pick, yes. you know? Yes. Well, yeah. You know, you can't pick 92 lamps anymore. So yeah, well, but, I might have to uh, resort to some lamps every once in a while. That's perfectly fine. I'm okay with a lamp <laughs> here and there, Steve. In fact, this week I started nice. off with a lamp. Why don't we dive into the fun campaigns and I'll take the first one here. Starting off this week for my first fun campaign, we have the Adaptable Top 
I absolutely love the name on that. Adaptable. Adapt oh, Tabletop LED Edition, a modular Adaptable. tabletop for board gamers, which I think is absolutely awesome. This is basically an LED based tabletop where you can put components inside of this kind of ordered off tabletop to play your D&D or other RPG tabletop games or really any type of tabletop game. It allows you to add in component pieces that you may have from other campaigns or that you've 3D printed yourself and really allow you to build an immersive kind of experience with it, which I think is really cool. The other idea behind it too is to kind of raise the board off of the table, protecting it from potential spills and other things like that, where it may end up damaging cardboard pieces or plastic pieces or other things like that. So the whole thing features legs and LEDs, which are actually able to be controlled by your phone, which is really really cool oh that is cool i'm so like out of this realm <laughs> it, so it's cool to see just what is created around all this you know this crazy world it's really so intense man in depth it really is in depth and intense and one of the cool things about this is i think in spite of it being built for tabletop gaming the whole premise behind this is really a lit up led table you could use this for so many things you could probably use this for a light box or a light table in a pinch if you really had to like there's so many cool things that this could be used for above and beyond its intended use one of the thing that really stands out to me that i really like is the idea that there's five different heights of the legs there but it almost uses yeah. like a lego-esque connection system to it which is really cool it allows you to actually print out your own 3d model legs so if you wanted to do something where it was more of like a uh say it was like a greek or a roman period game you could put this little like uh ionic column on it i can't even, i think that might be that's cool. I think that's the name of the column type there where it has the two scrolled circles, but neither here nor there. If someone knows what that one's called, drop it in the comments below as well. But I think it's really clever that it's not just a fixed table. It's a very modular table in the way that you can make it more theme oriented. You can change the LED color. You can make the, the LED color change based on the mood of the game and things like that. Yeah, that's really cool. You know what? If it's nighttime, you can make it blue and dark and, you know, it's really, really cool. Perfect. I called it there. Ionic leg. I'm glad I remember that. Crush I remembered it, something it. from like sixth grade geography. So there we go. But nice. yeah, dude, I really dig the idea behind this. And you can see kind of in action here, a lot of visuals around the use case of it. And the idea that you can actually build out these little like secondary sides to it as well. So cool, dude. This, this is such a huge world. I was actually doing some research on, uh, you know, D and D and stuff like that. And last year, because of uh, COVID, they were up thirty three percent. That's crazy, dude. That is out of control. And here's a great thing about it too. Look at this risks and challenges. This is like, this is as long as some of the campaigns we see, and it makes me happy to see such a well built out risks and challenges there. Yeah, good job. Looking at here, dude. All things considered, modular LED system wow. only. $53. So here's the standard edition of the tabletop. You're looking at $87 for this. So wow, that's cheap. it really is for the modular aspect of it. And the fact that there's other components that you could 3d print to make it kind of unique and its own kind of personalized thing, which I think is really cool. How much does the, the actual like set that you get with the led with this, the, to the stands and everything. Is there like, that was it. That's the standard edition there, which is the, uh, what's here you go. One table right. adaptable, adapt tabletop, LED edition box, six panel sizes, uh, lighting system included. Check the pledge description for more details. Val. What's that coming at? That one comes in at 99 bucks for the non early right. bird, but that's the early bird. That's the early bird. So that's the LED edition, 99 bucks. If you want it without the LED, it's 87. So for an extra $12, sure. you splurge for the LED. <laughs> Yeah, heck yeah. yeah. Dude, that's dope. It really is cool. And yeah. for another fun campaign this week, we have the Hyperjuice 4-in-1 magnetic wireless charger stand for iPhone. So I'm gonna, Ooh, for so I'm gonna, I'm, so I'm gonna call myself out on this one. I do not, in fact, have an iPhone, and I'm fine with it. But I saw this, and I, I am actually a big proponent of wireless charging. And I know how much of a pain it is when you have multiple devices and you need to charge them, but you only have one charging pad. So I really like to see the way that the iPhone ecosystem builds out these multi device charging stations, because I think it's really cool. And initially we saw it like as a a watch and phone charger 
or a AirPods and phone charger, but to see a four in one one where you could throw multiple devices on there. And if you actually look at that, it says Android or iPhone 8X or 11 on the bottom there. So it could actually be used by a multi technology family household. So if you and your spouse have different ones, you can both charge on the same wireless platform, which I think is really cool. For me though, wireless charging is so convenient because if you're tired, you just throw the phone on there and nine times out of 10, you're gonna hit the coils on the charger well enough that it's gonna charge for you. You don't have to worry about it. More often than not, I'm not knocking it off in my sleep. You know, it may not be as stable as a connection in there, but sometimes it's a hassle to just mess with the wire when you're like half asleep trying to get into bed. The idea behind it as well that you can also have everything charging in one place, really make sure you're not losing your AirPods or losing your iPhone, your Apple Watch and all this stuff make sure that you know where everything is you keep it in one place whether it's down on your kitchen table or on your nightstand or whatever but i think it's just so clean and simple and it was actually the cool thing that stood out to me about this is it's really kind of built in that iphone style as well yeah i mean i love the fact that the new iphones can you know just stand magnetically on that stand you know yeah. it's like it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be clipped in it doesn't have to be leaning on something just that uh magnetic features really cool. yeah how much does this come in at we are looking at ooh, a little bit pricey on it, but all things considered, 119 for the early bird special. The Kickstarter special is 129. All things considered, though, I've looked at dual charging yeah. pads before, and they usually come in around like 80, 90 mark. So for four yeah. devices, this really isn't that bad. I yeah, know it's a good price for sure. If you're looking for a way to just make sure that you know where your phone is at all times and it's not falling off your nightstand, this seems like a great idea. Yeah, I've actually seen this. For the past couple of weeks and I, you know, every time I'm like, maybe I'll do this one and then I find something else that I like better. <laughs> so I'm glad you chose it. It deserves the visibility because I definitely think this is a cool campaign. And obviously there's yeah. a big demand for it. 3,300 people have backed this campaign, eight hours to go, which means when this airs, this will actually be done. But with yes. all that in mind, I'm sure this is something that we're gonna see in a retail market as well, which I always think is cool. And I like the idea behind wireless charging because I just do think it is so much more convenient than plugging into the wall. Yeah, agreed. Steve, you ready for your first fun campaign this week? Let's do it, man. Let's do it. Right, let's jump into it. First up for Steve's fun campaign this week, we have the Bolt Actions Pens by Big Eye Design, which that little eye in the Big Eye Design kind of threw me off there, but made me laugh at the same time. So I dig it. Yeah. I really like the anodized coloring on these uh, pens with on the clips here. Yeah, dude, the video got me. You know, I'm, I'm a sucker for really not that video the top one <laughs> i'm a sucker for good music with good video you know and just the way they put that uh together was really well well done which i've seen bolt action <laughs> pens like this before and i've always gotten a kick out of them but this one looks really nicely designed good colors there and easily refillable which is always the thing with like a kind of third party pen if you're not getting a big pen or something else or a disposable pen like making sure ink fit and it's always a pain yeah and i mean i I'm a big stickler for how a pen writes. So that would be the only thing, you know, being uh, kind of skeptical going into something like this is, uh, you know, how it writes. I like ones that kind of flow off the paper and doesn't feel kind of rough. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah, like a disposable uh, ballpoint always feels like you're pulling against instead of having it actually roll correctly. Yeah, like the big pens, they work perfectly. Yeah. You know, they roll super easily, but this is a really nice looking pen. It looks like it's, also somewhat like looks like the clip can even come off too if you want yeah yeah no I, I i really dig it i'm not a huge fan of clips um you know i'm not gonna put them in my pocket yeah like that but it's uh it's definitely a, a sweet pen and you know i'm i'm always looking for a cool pen to have you know to write with on my desk you're looking at price point obviously <laughs> it's kind of pricey Dude, a good I'm pen though a good pen though is expensive 89 bucks actually yeah. is not a bad price for a full metal pen replaceable yeah. system and it's interesting yeah. too because you can actually choose what style uh refill you want in it whether you want like a rollerball or a parker style for your ink cartridges yeah yeah and it comes in uh, multiple colors which is always cool titanium draconium brass copper what's your favorite color on this one steve uh uh i mean i like the titanium ones man yeah. they're, they're just shop or the black one does look good yeah the shop shop pin I like it. Dude, I definitely dig it, man. Definitely a fun pen. And you know what? Not a lamp, so it definitely wins in my book this <laughs> week. 
I, Dude, I'll put a lamp in it. I'll put a light in the end. There you go. You throw a flashlight on the back. That's probably a stretch goal. <laughs> Bro, I can put that that flashlight I used last week because I bought one. So. You, you magnetize <laughs> it right on the back of the pen. Yeah, heck yeah. Little I don't two in one deal. Just like, boom. There you go, man. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Uh, and dude, honestly, even at that price point, look at that, 2,700 people back in this pen campaign, which is absolutely yeah. awesome to see. Because again, yeah. people are always looking for a good pen. I totally agree. Lifetime warranty, man. Well, yeah, because it's metal. Hopefully, unless you run that thing over with like a tank, it should be all right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and next up for another fun campaign for Steve, we have the Ergo Plax, the 15-in-1 Smart Ergonomic Sit and Stand Desk. I feel like you've been looking yes. for a sit-stand desk for a while now. So, you know what? I'm a huge fan of sit-stand desks. Uh, desks. I have one. All right. But, the, but it broke <laughs> when I was moving. My uh, my friend owns a moving company. I was helping him move, and the movers broke my desk. <laughs> uh, so it's it's kind of in that space right now, you know. So uh, I'm always looking at sit-stand desks. And, this one's really cool. I love that indent in the middle, which gives you a little bit more uh, accessibility to get a little closer, but have more uh, like wrap around feel yeah. on each side, you know, more tabletop space. This thing is fully loaded too. look at this wireless charger, power so cool, sockets, yeah. monitor arm, cable, monitor stand, cable tray like this is tense. Yeah, it's great, dude, and it's it's priced really well too, you know. But uh, you know, before we get into that, it has this this really cool pop up wireless, you know, obviously feature yeah. that you can see right there. Yeah, which is always great. You know, you can push down, get it out of the way, so it's nice and sleek and doesn't you know take up too much space. Uh, but it's really cool. It is really cool. Yeah, about three hundred and forty bucks too, which isn't bad for a sit stand desk. And a good portion of that is shipping as well, which isn't surprising considering. I wonder what the material is though. Is it a uh, is it a real wood or is it an MDF? It's I, I that I couldn't say. I think it's an MDF to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I'd say at that price point and just looking at like the veneer on it, it looks like an MDF. Yeah. yeah. This thing is cool. It kind of yeah. I mean, it, it, it's very similar to mine. This one looks a little bit thicker and you know built a little sturdier. I also got mine at IKEA. So, um, but you know. My desk is definitely big, uh, but it's definitely a nice desk. I dig it. And there's some cool add-ons too. You can get a monitor stand, your arm, a headphone yeah. stand, a retractable charging hub, tabletop size. Oh, so that adds that second little layer to it that we see in some of them where yeah. it's uh, one where it shows the like monitor, all yeah. of the stuff. Yeah, which is really cool. Oh yeah, like that yeah. right there. Dude, mm -hmm. definitely a cool desk and comes in multiple colors, which is always nice because I know for uh, Sometimes you find a desk that's a really great style for a room, but it doesn't fit the colors and it's just an utter loss. So for a medium brown, a lighter, and a black here, it's perfect. I just wish it came in white. You know me and my white. That's You know what, though? This, this like, natural elm is a pretty clean looking would Add an interesting kind of natural element to your white room. Yeah, I'd, prefer, I'd, I'd go with the darker color, though. I'd add more, like, even more contrast with the black versus white, yeah. Yeah. Definitely a fun campaign, man. And, and as you see with a lot of these really big campaigns on Kickstarter, it has a really thorough risks and challenges here. Dude, and it has an... It, they're working on an app. Oh, to allow you to like so remotely the, adjust the, the desk? Which, I don't know why you'd have to do that, but yeah. You're getting home and you know you're going to want to have it at 60% height, <laughs> so you do it from your car. Yeah, I, I don't know why you would do that either, but that's kind of cool. Know. I guess because I guess you can. Yeah, why not, dude? In this day and age, everything is a smart device, you know? Yeah. Absolutely love it. No, that's really cool, though, man. Definitely a fun week with some fun campaigns. We're always interested to hear what everyone else is out there back in this week. So if you found any other cool campaigns, playing card related, desk related, tabletop game related or whatever, definitely drop a comment down below. Let us know what you're really into. I know a few of you out there have been really anticipating some new tabletop games coming out. So if you've managed to get your hands on those, congrats and let us know what you think about them. And while we're at it, make sure you like the video, share it with a friend and subscribe to the channel. Hey, bye.